welcome back to another of Murdoch's Music Minutes. Today, after a bit of a break, uh, with another discography ranking, and I've chosen to take a look at the discography of The Jam. This band um, frequently is um, described or is given the terms of mod revivalists, mod punks, um, influential power poppers of the late 70s and the early 80s. And I think all these terms, these descriptions are quite fitting. But then there was so much more to the music of the gem than simply punking up the who or um, adding a bit of melody to classic UK punk rock. The Jam have left us a rather, not exactly small, but um, quite concise discography with um, six albums. And for those who have seen other ranking videos that I've done, um, I will again uh, try and apply my rather unwieldy approach to ranking the discographies which means I will do first I will do a discography walkthrough so I will talk about the albums uh, briefly not in terms of uh, full-length reviews but I will comment on the albums briefly in chronological order and then after that at the end of the video uh, for the impatient viewers who would like to skip forward at the end of the video, I will then uh, give you my personal ranking. Um, as mentioned, um, the jam gifted us, <laughs> another of my fantastic puns, uh, with uh, only six studio albums. Um, a lot of fans probably will claim that it is essential to, apart from the studio albums, also own um, the singles collection Snap, or maybe that this is even more essential than um, owning the studio discography. Um, and while that is true, I will not include um, uh, the famous Snap compilation in my um, ranking. But as an addition to that, um, it's definitely worth uh, having the, either the Snap Singles Collection or any of the other um, Jam Greatest Hits compilations uh, or Singles Collections. There are various ones out uh, there. Um, I've got the very best of the Jam, which basically um, simply unites uh, all of their singles on one CD. And um, this is um, a great listen. Now, the Jam are an interesting band because uh, they are viewed from very different uh, angles in America and in the UK. Um, as far as I um, realized, a lot of American listeners um, always shrug their shoulders when um, talking about the Jam or listening to the Jam. Yeah, it's it's nice. It's it's nice power pop, but we don't see what all the fuss is about. While uh, for the majority of jam fans in the UK, uh, this band is more important to the well-being of the British nation than uh, the royal family. Um, but uh, coming from a more continental, uh, Central European uh, background. Uh, I guess I can try and take um, a more neutral stance here. So uh, let's get into uh, the story of the Jam and most of all um, their studio albums and how I personally completely subjectively rank them at the end of the day. Here we go. Ain't got no money on the bank. But I've got the skills to rank. Mm. I have to think about that again. 
I think what's first of all really important to note is how very young the members of the jam were when they started their recording career. The band formed back in 1972. Um, they were basically a band of schoolboys playing rock and roll covers, soul cover versions. And you have to note that the members of the group, or at least Paul Weller, was only about 13, 14 when uh, he started to play in a band. They started out as a four-piece band with Paul Weller, Bruce Foxton, um, another guitarist and singer Steve Brooks and Rick Buckler on the drums. Uh, Weller, interestingly, up to that point was more of the bass player in the band and Bruce Foxton was the second guitarist. Um, Weller then discovered uh, the early records of The Who and The Small Faces and became completely immersed in the mod style and the music of the mod years in the UK um, from roughly you know, the era of 1965, 66, um, when beat became more aggressive, but before uh, the whole psychedelic phase. Steve Brooks eventually left the band and um, the jam first auditioned for a new guitarist, but then decided to remain a trio. And at that point, uh, Weller took over the job of uh, main guitarist and vocalist, while Foxton switched to bass guitar. And even at that young age, the band was quite eager and uh, tried to um, do things rather professionally. Um, they played uh, in a lot of clubs and pubs um, around London and um, the Woking area, which was where they were from. And early on, uh, the band also had a manager in Paul Weller's father. And this attitude, but of course also their talent, finally led to um, a record contract with Polydor in 1977. It was the year, the big year, when punk broke in the UK and took over the rock world by storm. To uh, much to the disdain of uh, classic rock fans, and um, also uh, the jam were somehow meshed up in, with this scene or were tried, uh, Polydor tried to sell them um, as another upcoming punk act. That the jam were fans of the 1960s sound was also demonstrated by Paul Weller sporting a Rickenbacker electric guitar. Um, the Rickenbacker, of course, is usually associated with the jingle jangle sound um, introduced by bands like the Birds, but also by the Beatles. This was not necessarily the most punk instrument you could get back in 77. Of course, there are uh, mod style music which was very heavy on power chords, fast tempo and a certain um, aggressiveness in the songs lend itself very well to um, punk rock which more or less um, pursued uh, the same ideals. Uh, three to four chords, frantic tempo and simply a lot of juvenile energy. And this is also what we get on uh, the debut album from The Jam, which was called In The City. <laughs> The sound and attitude on this debut album probably pretty much reflected um, the mood of teenagers and young adolescents in the UK in the mid and late 1970s. I mean, I think this was not necessarily the happiest of times to be a, a young person. Um, us who were born later, maybe, uh, we look back at this only through uh, the glasses of pop culture 
and see all those great artists happening in the late 70s, especially the punk rock explosion. But uh, we one shouldn't forget that this was very much driven by um, a fair amount of uh, frustration. Um, the economic situation in the UK, I think, really was a bit dreary. Um, it was hard to, to get proper jobs as, um, as a young person. Uh, politics weren't the best for young people. Uh, and all this, um, of course, uh, fueled the no future and um, nihilist um, attitude of a lot of the punk bands. And while the Jam were not really a true punk band, um, they also, of course, um, reflected this spirit in their songwriting. Uh, Weller was about 17, 18, when he came up with the songs for this um, debut album. In the City, the title track uh, of the album was released beforehand as a single and, uh, which was quite um, an achievement for, for a young new band, um, after all reached uh, the top 40 straight away in uh, Britain. Also, I think uh, this debut album did quite well in the charts. Um, yes, it is a great energetic album if you, if you want to have some, um, as I said earlier, I think in my introduction, some punked up, um, mod rock sound. Um, it's juvenile, it's aggressive, very fast paced, uh, short, snappy songs. Um, the title track is is excellent. I think it's it's the best um, song on this album. Uh, but there are also other great entries that are that oscillate somewhere um, between a 1960s mod revival and um, UK punk rock, all driven by Weller's power chords, very sharp guitar sound, and simply the energy of this power trio. Um, in terms of production, it's very basic, very straightforward. Um, don't expect any intricate arrangements or any interesting, you know, um, sound experiments in the songs. This sounds pretty much like a young energetic band playing their live material in the studio. The band announced themselves with the high energy uh, art school as the opening track of the album um there are songs like uh, the the snotty very ironic uh, i changed my address which um i think is also another highlight on this album then they included uh, some fun cover versions um slow down which uh, in the 60s uh, had already been covered by the Beatles on a B-side, I think. But listening to the jam version, I would go as far as um, claiming that uh, the jam's version is even more fun than the Beatles version. I think the original of this song is by Carl Perkins, um, but I'm not too sure. And they also included the Batman theme, this is often frowned upon by fans and listeners as a bit of a irritating throwaway on the album, but um, I think this is simply a nod to uh, um, the, the party scene of 1966. The Batman theme uh, was very popular. The Who covered the Batman theme in a very garagey fashion around the time of their second album. And I think even uh, the Kings and a few other of the great British beat and mod bands had this one in their repertoire. Yeah, it's maybe nothing to write home about, but um, it's it's quite fun and probably is there to to underline this uh, these 1960s roots that the Jam wanted to bring back to the table, as opposed to a lot of other punk bands who. Um, sort of at least publicly neglected as being old-fashioned and providing the dreaded roots for anything classic rock and progressive rock which of course was the big enemy for for any proper 
punk bands in the late 1970s. Yeah, this is a this is a fun little album. Um, a nice uh, piece of the times, and there are I think there are hardly any slower tracks on this album, although you get a little bit um, of Motown chord progressions um, hidden in songs like "I Got By in Time" or um, "Away from the Numbers." So uh, with this rather impressive debut out, which also gained a lot of positive reviews back then. Um, Polydor were hoping um, for the jam to be their, the, the label's um, new testimonials for um, a cooler image. Uh, Polydor were struggling a bit uh, at that time to um, get, you know, hip and popular bands of this new movement uh, in their roster and uh, the jam were the great hope now which also uh, probably is the reason why the label really pressured the band to come up with their sophomore with a follow-up release to in the city very quickly and very quickly here meant really quickly because i think only five or six months later Still in the same year, in 1977, uh, the Jam's second album was released. And um, to emphasize uh, that this was a young modern band, and also uh, probably um, to hint at uh, their mod image, the album was called This is the Modern World. This is a modern world. This is a modern world. Now, second albums often are quite um, a hurdle for, for any band, and uh, pushing out a second album filled with original material uh, would put any songwriter under quite some pressure, given that uh, Paul Weller uh, still was very young, I think 18. Um, I guess it's not surprising that he really felt the pressure and uh, this had uh, a negative effect on um, his songwriting, uh, namely that he uh, really struggled to come up with um, good enough and enough material for this second album. Um, so uh, since this album was really rushed, um, there are again a few cover versions to, you know, pad out the album's track list. And I think even some material contributed by Bruce Foxton, which was quite unusual. Um, in between, the jam also recorded non album singles, something they would do throughout their entire career, and um, very often. Um, those singles were quite excellent, um, which is the reason why, um, if you are interested in the jam, you definitely need to also have uh, their singles um, as a compilation somewhere. But even the singles um, around the time of This is the Modern World, I think, are among their, their weakest ones. The album suffered a little bit from this time pressure, the rushed recording, um, recording songs that weren't really polished up and finished yet or hadn't been rehearsed properly. And at some points on the album, I think you can hear this. This is the modern world very much continues the style and formula of the debut album, but it sounds less immediate, less urgent. Uh, one could also say that this shows that um, the band had progressed a little bit and was a bit more controlled and reined in in their performances. Um, the opening track, the title track, is is excellent punk power pop, uh, as the jam did in their earlier years. Uh, probably one of the best songs on the album. London Traffic is another great high energy punky power pop track. Um, elsewhere on the album, the band audibly tried to 
at least tentatively add a little more variation and diversity to their music, um, at least rhythmically. They try um, a few different things occasionally. Tonight at Noon has some nice vocal harmonies. Some of the songs at least try to slow down things a little bit, which is never too bad on a full-length album. And the band closed the album with um, a cover version of Wilson Pickett's In the Midnight Hour, a soul classic that uh, was also very um, popular, uh, a favorite among the mods and uh, the Northern Soul fans. But I think due to the relentless pace of uh, recording singles, recording an album, doing live shows in between, touring, and then already uh, working on the next album, Paul Weller felt a little bit stuck as a songwriter, and that uh, led to a serious um, writer's block and artistic crisis when it came to uh, recording uh, The Jam's third album. I guess it's quite telling that the single released between uh, This is the Modern World and uh, third album by The Jam, News of the World, indeed was written by um, Bruce Foxton. I think the only time a Bruce Foxton penned song uh, was released as a Jam single. So in um, 1978, things didn't look too well in The Jam camp with Weller um, questioning his own artistic abilities or the direction he wanted to go in, at the same time receiving a lot of pressure from Polydor to already come up with the next album. And it's quite surprising that the third album turned out the way it finally turned out. And uh, that album is All Mod Cons. A lot of critics argue that uh, All Mod Cons is the point where Paul Weller really found his voice as a songwriter. Um, there are clear influences uh, from big uh, English songwriters such as Ray Davis from The Kinks uh, on All Mod Cons. The album's title again um, provides a pun on modernism and mod culture. And overall, uh, this album really is where the jam um, develop and expanded their sound and also definitely refined their songwriting. Not only the album's sound, but also the lyrical content is very British, very English. Uh, looking at life from a working class um, position, um, mocking the, the middle class. Um, there is room for acoustic ballads, the gorgeous, beautiful English rose. Um, but the jam also hadn't lost their energy and um, their punk backbone. Tracks like uh, Billy Hunt demonstrate this, um, a high-energy cover version of the King's David Watts, or um, the opening track of the album All Mod Cons. The arrangements become a bit more detailed and intricate, as can be heard on uh, power pop anthems uh, like Mr. Clean, or um, the wonderful In the Crowd. And the album also featured songs that had been released as singles shortly before All Mod Cons was, was released, and uh, which up to that point definitely were the, some of the best songs the Jam had released. Um, first and foremost, Down in the Tube Station at Midnight. Re-energized by the success and positive reviews, Weller and uh, his two bandmates were spurred on to um, 
even up their ambitions a little bit more with the fourth album. And this started out as a concept album. Setting Sons was supposed to tell the story of three uh, childhood friends who go to war and afterwards meet again. Um, like their uh, other albums before, uh, of course, it is filled with um, social commentary and um, quite political lyrics at times. But somewhere along the way, also again due to time pressure from the label, um, the concept somehow was dropped. Um, it can be uh, detected in a number of tracks on Setting Suns, but on the whole, um, this is not a concept album, but again, um, a collection of unconnected uh, songs. Setting Suns was even more successful than its predecessor. It reached number four in the UK and also um, featured the first uh, top 10 single uh, the jam ever released in the Eaton Rifles. Sound-wise, and also in terms of the content, the lyrical content of a lot of songs, um, especially those that uh, were intended for this um, concept. Um, the album is a bit darker, more hard-edged, and also a little bit more experimental compared to uh, the three albums before. The album came out in 1979 and includes um, some great jam power pop classics such as Girl on the Phone, the aforementioned angry and dark Eaton Rifles, but also shows that the band uh, was quite ambitious at this point. We get um, Smithers Jones, a song written by Bruce Foxton. I think the last time um, a Foxton solo number was included on a jam album. This track had already been released before as a B-side in a full electric band version, but for the album they uh, changed the arrangement completely and instead um, used um, a string uh, section for the for this track, um, which of course resembles uh, Eleanor Rigby by the Beatles, which is also a pop song um, solely carried by um, a string section. But this is a really uh, fine song written by Bruce Foxton. The catchy Wasteland, uh, which already is a little bit more new wave than punk rock, and um, the ambitious track uh, Little Boy Soldiers, which consists of um, different parts. It's not exactly progressive rock, but it's a sort of progressive power pop, I guess. The album then finishes with yet another cover version, Heat Wave by Martha and the Vandellas, um, originally um, a Motown hit and this again of course uh, is a nod to uh, the mod audience of the jam that the jam wanted to branch out and um, expand their sound was furthermore demonstrated by the next album released in 1980 and called sound effects Sound effects also was not unproblematic um, to record because, again, for a brief moment, Weller faced some writer's block. Uh, he wasn't very happy with the Polydor label policy, but also um, he wasn't very happy with what he had written so far, even though there were um, songs 
in his repertoire for the next album, which should turn out to become jam classics. Uh, then, um, apart from that, there were also technical problems. Um, the pressing of the album saw some um, mistakes with, I think, um, the the printing of the artwork. So um, the label again ran into time pressure and also into an exploding budget due to all those uh, technical issues. But Sound Effects finally was released in due time for the Christmas market in 1980. And um, this album showed um, a quite different side to the jam's sound. Sound effects could be seen as the most varied and also the most experimental uh, of the jam albums. Of course, it's still rock or pop rock music at the core, but the band threw in more contemporary influences on this album. We're talking about the late 70s, the early 80s. Punk had um, moved on into... Uh, the more arty and and often darker post-punk uh, new wave was on the rise and um, there were also other movements very popular in the UK, especially um, the so-called uh, two-tone scene uh, named after the two-tone label, uh, which combined uh, post-punk with um, the music brought in by um the immigrants from Jamaica and the Caribbean, namely reggae and ska music. Ska had already been around in the UK from, I think, the mid to late 60s. Uh, but now the, the late 70s and the early 80s were the big ska explosion in the UK. Um, ska and reggae all of a sudden influenced everything from new wave to radio-friendly pop music. Just think about um, songs like Do You Really Want to Hurt Me by um, Culture Club, which is a bona fide uh, reggae track, actually. And some of that also can be heard on uh, the material for sound effects. The first half of the album um, already has some um, surprises in that direction. The arrangements had become even more intricate and um, carefully thought out. I think the songwriting of Paul Weller again had taken a step forward uh, with this album and there are some timeless a jam classics on sound effects. Most of all, of course, um, that's entertainment. Their acoustic, well, not really ballad, but their acoustic indie pop classic, uh, which is basically uh, built around two chords. Um, then we get the famous start, which is um, maybe the most, maybe the most uh, openly. 60s inspired single um, and was built around the the basic structure of the Beatles Taxman. Nowadays uh, you would call this a bit of a ripoff, uh, but it was very successful and of course even back then people were aware of Start sounding very much like Taxman by the Beatles, but that did not stop the single from reaching number one in the UK. Another cool tracks worth mentioning are uh, the opener Pretty Green and the more post-punk influenced, um, darker and very uh, political Set the House Ablaze. It was the time when art punk bands like Wire and XTC gained critical acclaim in Great Britain and sound effects seamlessly um, joins um, this style of music. It also became the jam's most successful album release in the USA. Around that time, the jam also released their most successful non-album single, Going Underground. But 
one could tell that Paul Weller was apparently getting a little bit restless and um, dissatisfied with the jam. He wanted to uh, change the sound, um, experiment a little bit more, and this becomes extremely apparent on the final album that the jam released in 1982, and that album was called The Gift. <laughs> The gift fell into a phase when Paul Weller, still very young, uh, only 24 at that point, grew more and more uh, unhappy with the musical direction and the confines it brought to his songwriting uh, being in the jam, because the fans still had this very clear notion of what the jam were and what they should sound like. Maybe also Bruce Foxton and Rick Buckler were quite happy continuing uh, the mod-influenced power pop sound. But this was not what uh, Paul Weller was at back in 1981 and 1982. Instead, his vision uh, was to add a more soulful um, sound to the jam, bringing in horns, um, bringing in more northern soul and also uh, funk influences. This is uh, a very prominent feature of The Gift, um, which should turn out to be the final album by The Jam, because shortly afterwards Weller announced that uh, they would split up. In an almost desperate or aggressive move of announcing and demonstrating that The Jam now were changing their sound, um, a single was released before The Gift, I think, yes, a non-album single again, called The Bitterest Pill I Ever Had to Swallow, which really is a bit of an odd one out in even in, among the jam singles. It was their attempt or their version of a kind of soul ballad, and it baffled and uh, confused uh, not only jam fans, but uh, I think also the critics didn't really know what what to do with this single and as far as i i remember um this was not one of the most successful ones not the best uh science for the upcoming album the gift ironically a working title for the gift uh was running on the spot um which maybe reflected uh, Weller's frustration or his feeling of, you know, being stuck, being tied to a certain style and sound, when the gift is everything but that. It actually throws in everything that um, Weller seemed to, to be influenced by at that time. The album really is a hodgepodge full of surprises at least compared to what the jam had done before or before sound effects. Um, we have tracks like Ghost, which sound a little bit like something the police could have done. You get um, the jam classic, the very Motown town called Malice. Um, they do all of a sudden funk or at least try on um, the very urgent, groovy Freshes. Then um, there is Just Who's the Five O'Clock Hero, another track that is more um, soul-influenced. Uh, it was um, quite a successful single. Circus, which is pretty much New Wave. And uh, the closing track, uh, also the title track, The Gift, is another nod back to uh, the 1960s soulful uh, groove rock uh, of, of those days. An interesting, very varied album. The Jam um, then released uh, a final single called 
Beat Surrender, which was also a little bit more soul influenced, a very solid track worth checking out. Um, and then Split Up. Paul Weller went on to form the Sophisti Pop Institution, the Style Council, a band that to this day uh, meets mixed opinions, even among Paul Weller hardcore fans. And a lot of uh, the Jam fans were really surprised and very sad that the band had come, uh, in their opinion, to a very sudden and too early end. But yes, they left us at least with those six albums. And now it's my task to somehow rank these six albums. Number six at the bottom of my personal list, not an entirely terrible album, but an album that becomes a little bit monotonous and uninspired after the first few tracks, in my opinion. This is The Modern World from 1977, their second full-length release. It starts off pretty strongly with the title track, The Modern World, and uh, Bruce Foxton's London Traffic, a song that often gets maligned, but I think um, this is pretty strong, sort of recalling um, the energy of the jam's debut. Standards shows that the band is trying to move on a little bit and to develop their sound, but uh, after that the album becomes a bit samey and directionless for me. Um, they tried to recreate the explosion of energy from their debut album in the city, At the same time, they try to refine their sound a little bit and to sort of polish up their songwriting. But for me, it doesn't really work all the way through. It's unfortunately, for most of the time, a solid but rather forgettable second album. At number five, I'm going back to uh, the debut album, 1977's in the City. For a debut album of teenagers, this is really, really remarkable. It's the most punk-sounding album by The Jam, and yes, it could be accused of uh, being a little bit one-dimensional, because almost all of the 12 tracks just crash forward with um, power chord driven punk energy and a fast tempo but still i take this juvenile energy over um the little the lack of inspiration of uh, this is the modern world some of my favorites on in the city are the title track i've changed my address the very fun very urgent sounding uh, party cover version of slow down also, non-stop dancing is, is quite interesting. Yeah, uh, more than solid debut album. Coming in at number four for me, and this is one to shock the fans a little bit, is 1979's abandoned concept album Setting Suns. Now, I'm fully aware that this is one of uh, the band's most critically acclaimed albums and also fans usually have it at least as their top three or top two spot. But this album never really clicked with me, to be honest. There are some excellent individual tracks, such as um, Wasteland, Smithers Jones, The Eaton Rifles easily is the best thing on here. Also, the opening track, Girl on the Phone, is, is pretty solid. But then a lot of the material for me always sounded a little bit samey or almost like the jam by numbers. They seem to rehash their power pop phrasings that uh, you already hear on This is the Modern World and All Mod Cons. 
And even though they add some additional instruments and try some new things in their arrangements, a lot of these songs on here are not exactly memorable for me. The lyrics on here are pretty great. Um, and I just wished they also had done a little bit more with the music on Setting Sons. Um, Thick as Thieves, for example, which is a fan favorite, never really did too much for me. Um, I can barely remember it after I've heard it. Also, their attempt at doing a more complex, multi-part song like Little Boy Soldiers, for me, falls a little bit flat. I've got more respect for their attempt than for the um, the actual outcome. So, yeah, Setting Suns, it's a good but a little bit difficult album to get into. So let's move on to my top three. At number three, the bronze uh, position, I choose the Jam's final album, The Gift. This is a very uh, divisive um, release. There are fans who are of the opinion that this clearly is the weakest album the Jam released and that they were really um, scraping uh, the bottom of the barrel with this one. And then there are fans who put this uh, as their number one album. Um, it's the most polished, most pop-sounding album by The Jam, and uh, what sets it apart from the other albums the most, I guess, is the soul and uh, funk influence you get on a lot of tracks. Elsewhere on the album, there's a little bit of weird experimentation with tracks like Trans Global Express or The Planner's Dream Goes Wrong. Of course, not the strongest music the Jam ever put out, but I don't mind these tracks. And um, I think this album is is really nice to listen to. And then, of course, it is pushed upwards for me by some of the really great uh, singles. Most of all, Town Called Malice. This is this is just such a fun track to listen to. Uh, combined again with rather serious, very um, observative lyrics by Paul Weller. But if I'm in the right mood, I can also enjoy their attempt at funk called Precious. Um, a lot of fans don't really like this one. I think it's it's a cool track, though you could accuse this one of being a funk song that is not really funky. <laughs> but I like it. So yeah, The Gift. I think this is an album worth rediscovering, maybe. At number two, The Jam's foray into post-punk and psychedelia a little bit, Sound Effects from 1980. This is just uh, filled with great songs and tunes, despite a few experiments that don't really work out. Um, music for the last couple, I'm looking at you, for instance. Also, Dreamtime is not exactly memorable. But this is made up for easily by a lot of excellent jam tracks. Pretty Green is a favorite of mine. Monday is very catchy. I also like the more punk-infused, but I'm different now. Um, the darker political edge of Set the House Ablaze. This works for me a lot better than the darker tracks on Setting Suns. And of course, um, That's Entertainment. Probably one of the best songs the Jam ever did. Also one of the best singles, although it never was a UK single. So, if you've paid enough attention, you now know what my number one spot is going to be. And uh, I settled for their third album, All Mod Cons. For me, this represents what the jam were all about in the best possible sense, apart from some of their iconic non-album singles. The mod meets punk meets new wave meets power pop sound is captured here just perfectly. Paul Weller for the first time showed what he could do as a songwriter apart from you know putting together power chords. 
the opener almost comes um, directly followed by to be someone maybe is one of the best one-two punches on any jam album. I like the guitar lick in Mr. Clean. English Rose is just beautiful, showing a tender, poetic side to Paul Weller that up to that point never had emerged on records. In the Crowd is an anthem for the ages. Fly is, is an interesting track combining uh, their power pop elements with an almost jazzy acoustic arrangement. And the album closes with two further favorites of mine, the very aggressive A-Bomb in Water Street and possibly one of the very best singles ever, Down in the Tube Station at Midnight. This is the closest the jam ever came to recording and releasing an absolute classic, in my opinion. On this one, there hardly is any weak spot. So, um, yeah, if you are planning on just having one jam album, then I would say pick this one. And if you enjoy this one, you probably will find yourself very soon afterwards owning a few more jam albums. Whew. Another ranking marathon accomplished. Uh, that certainly did not feel like running on the spot. So yeah, I hope you enjoyed going through the jams discography with me and are not overpowered by too much uh, mod revival power pop now. This is a band that is very often hailed more for um, its non-album singles than for the studio albums, which, as I said in the introduction, um, might be true to some extent. But uh, still, as you hopefully also took away from my discography walkthrough and my ranking, the studio albums by The Jam are nothing to uh, ignore. Um, and actually, at least the ones I mentioned on my top three uh, positions are really worth having in their entirety as albums. So maybe you now are interested in listening to some more by The Jam yourself. Maybe you are already a Jam fan, then let me know where you agree or disagree with my ranking. I guess there will be a few fans who uh, now will try and carry the torch for uh, Setting Suns, which is absolutely fine. Um, yeah, let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching. If you're interested in more in-depth reviews of some of the Jams albums, I've done two so far, All Mod Cons and Sound Effects. Um, check them out in my videos. And for now, thanks for sticking around. Thanks for supporting the channel. Maybe see you around for another ranking or another album review in the future. Ta-da!